Hey guys, Khalid from Cricket Fanatics Magazine here and today we are with another episode, episode 20. So it's special to me because it's a round number, it's after a long hard work that we've put in 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 this lockdown series. So this is episode 20 and I needed to bring someone really special, someone that I really admire in this industry and it's uh, Faik David. I would say South African sporting legend because it's not just in cricket that he's made his mark, it's other sports too that he's really made a mark in for many people and he's been a, a real inspiration to many many people around this country and obviously in a difficult period as well so let's just start by saying hello Faik and welcome to the platform hi Khali thank you thank you very much for having me uh, it's a pleasure being here looking forward to share some of my stories with you okay thanks this is going to be amazing I'm really excited so let's just start with I kind of start of the show just by talking about the current event so obviously the lockdown and you being a coach can you maybe give some tips to the youngsters out there that are struggling now, obviously because of lockdown, maybe some of them don't have big uh, areas outside to play cricket, etc. But are there ways for them to keep their cricket skills sharp as well as keep their fitness sharp? Well, yes, of course, it's a very um, unique situation that we find ourselves in, in terms of this COVID-19. And um, yeah, we were always all surprised in terms of you know what, what is happening. So obviously you need to think outside the box in terms of how you can keep yourself fit and obviously in terms of your cricket as well. And um, the advice I can give to youngsters out there, I mean, use your, you can use your room, you can use, you know, if you have a backyard or you can have a front garden, if you have a front garden, you can use that. And obviously we're now in the off season period, which is also where most of the cricketers are taking breaks and rest and, you know, because they had a tough, long, hard season. And it's also maybe there's a period where you can actually rest before you start your, your program again. So um, physical, um, I mean, attributes that you need to get uh, to get better at is obviously your strength, your core. And those are all things that you can do indoors, you know. So um, strength work, press-ups, sit-ups, um, you can do your burpees, you can do your, 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 your jumps, you can work on, on glutes, you can work on your, 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 your legs. You know, that is the core for any, if you are a fast bowler, those are core things that you, and important things that you need to work on. So I will say there is, you can think outside the box in terms of how you can do those things. I know not everybody is, uh, has got weights that they can work with, but they can use their body weight. And, and there's a lot of programs also on, 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 uh, on the internet and how you can use your body weight as a, as a counterweight for, for, for your exercises. And with regards to cricket techniques, um, and I've seen like people running the passage bowl into their parents, but from a young age, I'm talking about like 12 year olds and 10 year olds, maybe younger. I'm like, I don't know, mostly parents, especially don't like the ball in the house. So like, I don't know, I don't know if that's going to work. But and with batting, I heard some stories about putting a sock on a row on a string. I think Faye told me about that one where you tie it around a tree or something and you just start hitting. Um, are they, you being specifically a great batsman in the day, back in the day, um, what are sort of tips that you can give for, to keep your cricket skills sharp necessarily? Well, I mean, what I can add, if you've got confined spaces there, I mean, I can challenge you in terms of also hitting a smaller ball with a thinner piece of, uh, piece of stick or, um, or a beam or something small that you can mm. get your eye coordination going. Um, hitting against the wall, for example, you know, um, for the youngsters, they're also getting used to um, shadow batting in terms of in front of your mirror, you know, your grip and try and see what your back lift looks like, see where your head is going in terms of if you move. So there's all these little small little things that you can work on your hand eye coordination in terms of maybe juggling balls and stuff like that, you know, um, because obviously certain guys have got more space where they can work in and otherwise that may, other guys that maybe got you know, confined spaces that they work in. So it depends what you have. Ball in a sock, with a golf ball, uh, hitting, you know, even using your cricket bat and try and see if you can just middling it. But obviously you're not hitting hard because it's yeah. a harder ball to break windows and whatever the case may be. So it's all control stuff, you know. I mean, those are the only things that you, you can actually do to try and maybe improve your skills. That's awesome. So, guys, you must try that, but please stay safe. Um, don't don't break your mother's windows or don't break windows at home or neighbors' windows. You don't want that to happen. Um, so, this is really what I wanted to get into, and it's the crux of it. Um, I saw some of your posts on Facebook that you gave and on Instagram, of course, about previous teams that you were in, etc. But let's start with the journey at the beginning. 
because I like to hear the story on when you started and how cricket came to you or how I know you played multiple sports, not just cricket. Um, but talk to, talk to me a little bit about your journey as a kid and, and how you were inspired by sports specifically. Yeah, well, I mean, it started in the 70s, you know. I mean, for me, um, it all started at school um, where we were introduced to playing school cricket. And um, intervals at school, it was always just cricket if it is summer, obviously, and obviously rugby, um, playing in quads on tar. When we play rugby, I mean, yes, I mean, we had a lot of uh, um, incidents with our parents also because the shirts, the school shirts were torn and whatever the case may be. But that is what we had, you know. I mean, it was something that um, I grew up with in terms of a, um, there's a school, a, a school situation or a, a community that's into sport, you know. And uh, it was, a, for me, it was um, rugby and cricket. So I had an older brother, which was also very important to me because, I mean, he guided me going in that direction, you know. So he played cricket, he played rugby, he played rugby also um, at the provincial level. And, and he was the guy who normally took my hand and said, OK, we're going to go here, we're going to do this and that and the other. So it was never something in terms of planned. It was just the exposure to sport at that time. So I remember back um, coming from, obviously, school, school, school cricket, um, then wanting to join a club. I think I was about 13, I think I was, when I was first introduced to, to, um, to cricket in a formalized way. You mm. know, um, we moved to Lansdowne and um, there was like a couple of roads away from me, there was a net and it was like a makeshift net. It was like broken wires around and there was like a tar with a, with a, with a mat on top of it, you know. And every Friday afternoons, we, 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 we went there and obviously it, that is where the team meetings took place. That is where um, the team selections took place. And that is where you were told where you are playing the Saturday, for example. That was on a yeah. Friday. So on a Saturday you will go. And um, back then, obviously, you know, transport was, was a massive issue as well. So we would meet on the corner and then the, the bucky will come, the manager of the team. And he will at, pick up at various corners. He will pick up the, you know, the players. And we went on to go and play matches on yeah. Saturdays. And obviously, way back again, he will drop us off at, uh, you know, at the, at the spot and be close to your house. And then that was it, you know. No particular coaching. It was more a manager who took charge of the under-13 team, for example. So oh, okay. he will pick up. He will, will, he will drop them off. You will play your game. And you will just, you know, you will just expose. You learn, actually while you were playing you know that was i think for me that was the key thing for me back mm. then you know knowing and stealing with the eye you know um what other kids are doing if that looks right you steal with the eye and try and Im uh, imitate that so that is how it all started back then you know playing in the road every day after school you know we would make a, a pitch uh, tennis tennis ball tape ball um we would maybe um, put uh, imagine imaginary players or fielders around. So if you hit the ball in the in a certain area, you're out. So that is how we did it, you know, growing up, yeah. you know. And um, and I remember, you know, I mean, going through the age groups, you know, you always be selected to play in a in a provincial age group team as well. So for me, it was just having fun and being occupied on Saturdays and, and, and Fridays for, for training as well and meeting new friends, of course. Yeah, of course. And um, if I compare it, I'm going to compare it obviously a lot to the generation that I grew up in. So when I was growing up, it's depending on what school you went to, etc. Cricket's a very expensive sport. And this is something that a lot of people must realize that it's a very expensive sport that, that obviously um, not everybody can afford to play the sport as a batsman or especially um and and obviously this this that's what causes a lot of the problems maybe in the townships etc for with regards to equipment and they're always looking for people to help out with regards to it back then when when obviously we know about the issues that happen in south africa and obviously a lot of our players of color would have been restricted um to play the sport because of various reasons but with regards to equipment how did you get hold of equipment to be able to play um, and go through the age groups etc well, strangely enough, you know, I never had my personal bat at all. I was, I think, 19, 20 years old, you know. We, and I remember clearly, back then, we used to carry a team bank, 
the team bag was consistent, you know, consisting uh, three cricket bats, and you would have three sets of pads, and you will have three sets of gloves. I re- uh, gloves, and I remember it was like those pads with the bamboo still in in front there. You know, <laughs> there were still the gloves there with those little spikes on there. You know, so I mean, I don't think there was any real protection. You know, in terms, no helmets back in the day. Uh-huh. So I remember we had this big leather bag that we're carrying around wherever the bucky is going away picking us up the bag is obviously there and that goes with us you know and obviously one or two guys had their personal bats as well you know because i mean maybe they could afford that but i never had pads or gloves or anything of the sort and even us, we had to you know we had to share so uh, the, that was also part and parcel of everything, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So as soon as you come out, if you lose your wicket, you need to obviously, you know, get off at um, um, pad, pad down and so on so that the other guy can use this kind of thing. So, yeah, that was it. It was never um, an issue. We, um, my parents never saw me play. Um, my parents never saw me play rugby all my career because, I mean, obviously they had to work. They had to obviously, you know, put, put food on the table. So it was just... Obviously, the older brother is leading the way and mm. they pick us up. So we're all safe and we get dropped off so that, you know, um, everybody's safe also when you come home from, from, from your game. Wow. So we also were lucky, obviously, to, to experience um, a lot of heroes to look up to. Um, we had people that we can look up to because we've had teams of generations go forward. Who were some of the people that players that you got to see or did you get to witness a lot of players back then? I know you are were an inspiration for a lot of generations after you. So you actually one of those legends that the people looked up to. But with regards to who were some of the legends that you looked up to? Well, for me, you know, back then it was the dark days. Obviously, there was no um, um, normal sport, you know, because, I mean, we fought a battle within also in terms of, you know, um, where you were growing up in your society. And um, I remember back then, the Saeed Majid for me was massive in my life, you know, because he played cricket, he played rugby. Um, I remember back in the days when we used to play cricket um, from Jews. Then, because I was one of the guys that they, I, that they, that they acknowledged that I could play in senior games, I would then come from under 15 game and play in the third team or in the second team, never in the first team. But people would always then say, look here, yeah, I mean, yeah, they will always talk about Saif Majid, you know. And um, that guy that I grew up, you know, mentoring, you know, not mentoring, but I mean, idolizing as, as, mm. as, a, as a sportsman and, and also as a human being. And um, when I got older, um, I then had an opportunity to to obviously play with this man, you know, mm. and I could understand why people, you know, really um, idolized him. You know, I mean, he was one of the heroes in terms of, you know, sport back in the day. And he was such a humble guy. He never really, you know, was someone who was outspoken. But you see, when he stepped on the field, he was a different beast, you know. He was an opening bowler as well. He was a middle order batter as well. He played rugby. He was playing in the, you know, he was playing number eight flank four. Mm. He represented um, um, city and suburban back in the day, um, and he played obviously Western Province Cricket Board cricket. He was my captain also when I started making the senior side, you know. And uh, it was never something that was okay. I'm taking you under my wing and stuff like that, you know. You as a youngster stepping into the team, you needed to, you know, immediately understood, you know, in terms of. What was required? the competitiveness, your, 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 your game awareness, your, your skills that you have and where you should be. It was never coached to you. It was never shared in that way. It was just you watch and you learn and you need to be able to implement those kind of things almost like immediately. So Saeed Majid was massive for me. I remember also I played against Vincent Barnes. I mean, a mean, fast bowler. I mean, you know, those, are, those days we never had any helmets. Those days, we played on pitches that were uncovered. The, the pitches looked exactly the same color, like the out, like the outfield, the same color green. I mean, and you have these nasty fast bowlers running in, and uh, they want to take your head off. No helmets. Wasn't even thinking of you know that your life was you know, was at stake here, but it was the competitiveness you know 
it was the camaraderie of teammates and the competitiveness of of playing against you know other clubs also you know, in, in the province as well yes <clears throat> you because i mean i talk from a foot uh, my my history on football is much better than my my knowledge on the history of of man united for specific, specifically <laughs> um is much better than my history on, on on the local cricket and that's something that i'm trying to grow here and this is why i wanted to get you on the show because when i came into this industry and listened to the stories the way people spoke about Said majid was similarly to how people speak about duncan ferguson in man united back in the day so it's one of those plays that we never got to see but you always heard about and always was spoken about that if things were different in south africa he would have by far been the first name on the t-sheet and that, that's a lot of what a lot of people said so to hear that from you now and to say to hear that you can tell me those stories is unbelievable and to me to actually get to know him a little bit i was i was fortunate to meet him at least only once and it was very short i lived i didn't get to speak to him as long as i'd want to but um because we always have to run off and do other things but an amazing human being is definitely what i got from that from that situation very funny guys person as well so um i want you to talk to me a little bit more about that because you you went you got the opportunity to actually play for your country in two different sports and that's there's not a lot of people that were able to do that i mean more more local more common knowledge now the decent people someone like Herschel Gibbs they got to do something similar a guy like Rwanda Swat I know got to do something similar for schools week um so but not not at the highest level to play for South Africa at both in both sports so can you please maybe just tell me a little bit about that and the experience and what you had to do to go through to get to those points to be able to be recognized at both well for me um it's always been, you know, rugby and cricket because that is what I was exposed to. And I remember where rugby is concerned, I mean, I, I started playing under 35 kilograms because back then you weren't playing in age groups, but you played your size, you know. Okay. So under, under 35 kilograms, if that is your weight and under, you play in that team. So I remember going around foot playing a rugby, scrum off, fly off, center, wing, um, never played fullback though. But that is how I grew up in terms of rugby. So winter, that was immediately you go into, into your rugby mode, you know. There is no break off in terms of obviously you've got a month left to prepare for cricket if it comes to summer. So I play rugby until the end of the season and the very next you move right into cricket. So that is how the program was back then. And of course, you know, you are physically fit in one sport and obviously your, your skills on the other, other side of things when you play cricket again, you know, you need to adapt quickly as well, you know. So, so for me, rugby, fortunately, also, you know, I played all the age groups in terms of, you know, under 35, 45, 55 and under 18 and then moved into the senior ranks, you know. So the rugby went through that. Um, I finally started playing center and wing that was my final positions in rugby and uh, also then represented uh, south africa in, in in that position at um in fact win okay so so that that was my rugby my rugby career you know and so it was it was also you know involved in terms of that because he was also playing for the same club primroses as well and um it was for 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 me to see him you know lead the way he did in terms of the type of rugby, the type of person was, you know, and the skill that this man possessed, you know. Um, I stole with my eyes all the time, you know, um, without me knowing what I did, you know. It was more an instinctive, it was more um, a natural thing to do because if you really want to play, because there was no guidance from parents in terms of, you know, look here, okay, this is what you got to go do. you got to go do extra stuff with this, that, and that to improve that. There was no that kind of knowledge that was shared with me, you know. It was, you learn from the friends, from the people that you play with, around in your community. Um, and, and that is how you actually got a night in your community back then, you know, through what you've done on the, on the, on, on the sports field on the Saturday. People who talked in the end week about, did you see this, that and the other? And that was quite back then, you know, because it wasn't, it wasn't recorded in newspapers, you know, as at that age, you know. So you among friends, it was always about, hey, did you see this, that, and the other, you know. So that yeah. was your 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 reward 
Saturday, that you spoken all you know, of what you have done the pre the previous Saturday. So rugby then I then played for City and Suburban, which was the provincial side. And mm -hmm. then at the end of my career, I moved to Western Province Green Greenpoint Track. So City and Suburban was based at City Park. So we played all our rugby there. So you had City and Suburban in, in, in Cape Town, City and Suburban as a provincial team, Western Province Greenpoint Track, Western Province um, Board, which was um, the, uh, the Langa Nyanga people. And then there was Somerset West. They were also as a provincial team. Then Roland. Then there was Tigerberg. So it's about six, seven teams, Western Province country, six, seven teams sure. that came out of Cape Town as a, as provincial team. So I remember back then you go on Saturday, you go and play rugby at City Park, and then all the clubs are represented on that Saturday. So it was massive. So you had A field, the B field, C field, and D field in one in one space. So you had everybody there on a Saturday. So people will start playing senior rugby from 1.30 and 4 o'clock was the main 4 o'clock and the A was your main game to play. So that was the rugby. You know? So obviously with Greenpoint had the same thing. Green, at Greenpoint track, they had this in terms of their rugby structure there. So everybody played there at Greenpoint track and then they selected a provincial team there. And then obviously to get into the national team, it's all over South Africa. They select a, 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 a thorough uh, 15 team back then. And obviously, we couldn't tour. So we, we, they select a Saru team that will play against an invitation team, you know, yeah. to get your Saru, your national colors. So, yeah, yeah that was the rugby side of things. You know, I've made it twice in, a, um, in two consecutive years, you know, the, the, the national team. And then started breaking my, my wrist and my collarbones. And <laughs> I need to stop this rugby thing now. This rugby thing is becoming now, you know, you know, uh, life-threatening here. And uh, back then, you know, in rugby, there wasn't yellow cards and sitting mm. on the bench and stuff like that. You had to play your 80 minutes, you know, and that was it. There was no substitute. There was no protection from the referee back then because it was quite brutal also playing rugby there. So it was quite advantageous to have speed so that you can get away from all of these uh, aggressive plays and, you know, you know, do whatever skill you need to get an eye after a run. But it was, it was amazing because obviously community based, it was, you know, that was for me, the, the, the highlights for me is to, you know, play in the community based people and um, identify you in terms of what you have done on the field. It was never where you came from. It is what you, you're know, doing on a rugby field. And see a lot of people, um, had their joy and pride of, you know, the, supporting their clubs and so on, you know. Yeah. So that was the rugby side of things. And the biggest side of things, I mean, uh, also similar, you know, I mean, Western Province had a, had a, one team, obviously, in the Western Cape. It wasn't like, like the rugby again. So it was Western Province, um, cricket board back then. So it was clubs from all over, from Boerland, from, from Western Province here. It was all Western uh, Western Province cricket board back then, you know. So all the clubs that have been represented in that in that team. So they selected a team, and so in in, in Eastern Province, same thing happened there. They had uh, a team in Johannesburg and Durban, also Natal. Um, they had Griquas. They had all different provinces as well. And uh, to make that national team, you had to then obviously you know be the best in your field, whatever it is that you did. And you'll be selected then to play in your in your SAC B team, your South African Cricket Board team. Can you just mention quickly a few and of, of course, those? Of course, the sorry, of you. course the grounds that we played on. Sorry, and of course the grounds that we played on was not the Newlands. It was Florida Park. It was it was Turfall. It was it was um, um, Saint Augustine's ground, Alphendale. Mm -hmm. You know, those were the provincial grounds that we played on. You know, yeah. so it was completely different to, to back then. So we had our counterparts, which was the South African Cricket Union then. Yeah. So for those that didn't see the pictures, of course, and especially for cricket, which is obviously cricket fanatics. So can you maybe mention some of the names that you played with and what it was like to play with some of those people? Um, obviously, a lot of them are seen as um, legends of the games too. So can you maybe just mention a few of them? Well, when, when I started, I mean, I remember... I must tell you this story. I mean, when I was a 13, 13 years old, 14 years old, even younger maybe, 
Um, I got exposed to Newlands Cricket Ground through working. You know, there was a, a big scoreboard, a manual oper operated scoreboard mm -hmm. back then, you know. And um, uh, we had this uh, this guy who, who normally runs the scoreboard. So you needed about 10 guys to operate the scoreboard. So that back then you needed to paint it, you know, paint the news on those big boards, black boards there. And you had to, you know, um, put it in as you as you are batting or bowling. You know, oh, then there was overs. There was the, like the... The bowling analysis, the figures there of the bowlers, there was the total, batsman total, all manually in operated. So I was exposed to then Newlands cricket back then. And I I got to see Vincent van der Bale back then. I, I got to see uh, Barry Richards. I used to see um, Peter Kirsten, Alan Lamb, um, just to name a few, Hilton Ackerman, just to name a few back then. And I wasn't politically aware back then in terms of that we couldn't support you know but i used it as because it's a source of income for me also to work on the scoreboard to be able to survive out there but in the same time you could see what was their conditions like and compare it to what our conditions were like you know so mm -hmm. um those are the guys that i grew up watching also playing cricket and then obviously, you know, you, you, you go back to your, 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 your junior matches and you try and obviously also do all, ki all kinds of you know, shots that you have seen. Yeah. So when I started playing in, in, in the board team, first of all, you know, there were names like Mansoor Abdullah. There was Said Majid, Vincent Barnes, Siraj Gabriels. There was uh, Randall Kibudo, Nazim White, Ismail Behadin. Those were the guys that I played with in the, in the Western Province board, you know. And when 1991 came, you know, I was playing rugby cricket. I was one of the top all-rounders. I was quite, you know, I was, I was performing well in those two seasons there. So I was one of the top all-rounders back then. I was the informed all-rounder. And I was then asked to join the South African team, the, the team that went the historical tour to India. Mm -hmm. So that was in 1991. Yeah. And I got a call after unification now and so now the two boards came together the south african cricket board and the south african cricket union came together and uh, there was a team selected under the captaincy of clive rice i don't know if you remember i don't know yeah. if you know the I, i've that. heard of him obviously that didn't see him play <laughs> what was that i said i heard about it because that was around when i was born so <laughs> i did too <laughs> okay. so, so yeah so so then I was exposed to that. We went on a tour to India. I think it was a, a three-match tour that we lost 2-1 to India. And it was my first time that I went overseas. You know, I mean, I never had a passport or anything, but it was organized for me within, within a day or two. And um, I was asked to join the group to go to, to India um, under the captaincy of Clive Rice, you know. And... Um, so Clive Rice was in that team. Jimmy Cook was in that team. Um, it was Andrew Hudson was in that team. It was Peter Kirsten. Um, I think myself, Hansi Krunier, Derek Crooks, and uh, Hussein Mana. We were the additional players to join that team. Okay. So that was the first time then I was exposed to, you know, obviously the unification, the team, the United Cricket Board back then, you know. So it was called the United Cricket Board back then. And then in 1992, I was also fortunate enough to join the team to go to Australia in the first World Cup. Mm. So also, and you know, you know uh, in terms of um, selection, I wasn't I wasn't allowed to play, but I was allow allowed to travel with the team for experience no. or whatever the case may be. Um, I still say, you know, you know that is where we went wrong as administrators in terms of not giving us opportunity to actually play at that level. So then. Yeah. It was Hans Kronier, it was the John T. Rhodes, it was um, Alan Donald, it was Mary Pringle, Richard Snell, Tertius Vosch, um, who's the other guys, Mark Rashmir, Andrew Hudson, Peter Kirsten, you know, um, that was squad back then, you know, so, and then I came back from the World Cup and it was all difficult for me to break it, break into the Western Province team here because um, it was Adrian Capel also and Brian McMillan also in that World Cup squad. Yeah. So that's my so-called competition because they were all-rounders also and very good cricketers as well. 
So I never played really in the in the main team. I played in the B side back then. It was the B side and the A side, and and Brian McMillan and obviously Aidan Caper most uh, mostly played in all those matches there. And those were the guys that Gary Kirsten, the Jacques Callises, the Herschel Gibbs then came through in terms of that. So that was 1993, 94, 95, 96. You know, sure. so those were the kind of guys that then I played. But I felt very um, because you're the only guy of color. You know, you come from mm. a background and and uh, you felt and there was no the coaches never backed you. You've got to understand there was never like, oh. OK, this was it. The coaches never back then. The coaches were uh, Hilton Ackerman was my first coach then in the unification team. Never threw a ball to me. Um, Duncan Fletcher never threw a ball to me. But these were the, you know, the situation that you found yourself under. You know, there was like limited opportunities and. Every time I got an opportunity, I felt I needed to prove myself immediately. And I played mm. a different form of cricket because I always wanted to prove too quickly instead of settling myself first and then, uh, and then uh, try to, to take it from there. So that was in that era, you know. And um, I remember there was a single wicket competition that I had. I, uh, I received a, a, a benefit year from, uh, from Western Province for my service for cricket in 2000. And uh, I arranged an all-rounder competition at, at, at Newlands. And uh, the all-rounders were uh, Sean Pollock, Hansi Kronier, um, Lance Klusner, Herschel Gibbs, um, um, Derek Crooks, I think, was also one of them. And Andrew Hall, I think, was, uh, was another. I might have left out one or two there. But then I arranged also an all-rounder competition, you know. And uh, I think South Africa just came back from losing in the semi-final, you know, um, the World Cup in, in, in England. And obviously, Lance Klusner was also the best mm. all-rounder there at, you know, um, um, at the World Cup. And uh, I was drawn against him. And I remember also beating him in this all-rounder single week of competition <laughs> type of thing, you know. So, I don't know. It was just, you know, um, it was just very difficult at the time because I think, you know, you always had to prove yourself from the word go. And I yeah. think only the eyes opening after 1996, 1995, 1996, the country really bought into that it must be inclusive in terms of cricket. Yeah. And that's an amazing story over there because for a lot of guys that are in the current system, they must realize the opportunities that we have as kids now these days and opportunities that we have need to take complete. If people could work hard back then with not, absolutely nothing, we should learn the same right now um i feel like that the same thing is that we need to we need to show that we also appreciate what our parents went through what guys like you have gone through for us in this in this era um you spoke about someone that you looked up to and um i've spoken to some people that have looked up to you and i'm going to bring on a special guest now someone that has always spoken to me about you and someone that has always looked up to you when he was growing up as a cricketer. So it might be a kind of a surprise that uh, I'm throwing a little spell into the works here, but I'm going to bring him on. It's Ezra Pool. So. Thank you much. <laughs> Let's see. If I can see. Let's see. Yeah, so I'm going to bring Ezra Pool. <laughs> Thank you much. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, uh, if I, okay, I, I mean, the sound is not so great. So, I mean, I've got a list. The sound is not so great. So I don't know. So, um, let's see if I can hear you say. Okay, cool. Okay. So, so if I, um, I, I thought I'm bringing bring him on here because he's always spoken highly of you and some, and he's always spoken about you as someone that he looked up to when he was playing when he started cricket. So, I'm gonna give him a little bit of the reins to ask you some questions that maybe he wanted to know about. So, Ezra. The floor is yours. You can ask um, like any questions that you've always wondered about. Yeah, you know, there's so many that I wanted to uh, actually ask him. Um, you know, our, for us or for me, um, we used to have this World Series competition that we were able to see, uh, you know, like the Australia versus the West Indies and New Zealand and all of that. And I always used to be the all-rounder. I used to pick first and I used to pick Faik. Some people used to pick Steve War and whatever. But um, my question to Faik is 
that time that they didn't select you, did anybody ever come to you and talk to you about it and say, listen, this is maybe the reason to A, B, and C, or was it just like, okay, be grateful that you're on the talk? Well, I mean, there was never anyone that, like I said, you know, you, you're on your own. You know, I mean, there was never support structure in terms of that. And, you know, obviously management didn't really um, come up to you and, and explain the situation. You know, it is, like I said, you know, you needed, you needed to be on your feet. You needed to be a man. You needed to take that in, you know, um, um, on the chin. You, you expected your administrators to be there. They were never there really to support you in terms of, you know, um, um, that backing. I remember also uh, going to Durban one day and so being selected, leaving um, Cape Town, selected in the team to play against uh, Natal back then, you know. And uh, we got there and obviously I wasn't, I didn't find myself in the team. No explanation. It was just, you know, this is the team that's going onto the field and so on. So I, I found it very strange at the time, you know, um, but I mean, as a player, you wanted to play. You just wanted an opportunity. And the opportunity was never given to you um, also on a, on a fair, you know, situation because, I mean, they, you couldn't settle yourself in in terms of um, 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 getting used to the situation because it is something you're used to, playing at the Newlands, playing at the Kingsmead or whatever the case may be, you know. And um, I always felt that I, would, I could play better cricket in the, B, in the B team because I was more relaxed. You know, I could do what I needed to do and I thought, for me, that was that was my. Um, it's almost like you know, this is where I can ex express myself the way I normally do. You know, when it come obviously A team, it was always all all eyes on you because you were the only guy of color that is also in the team. But it was never managed in a way that you can say, look here, hey, okay, this is why you're not playing. This is why you're not being selected. Let's work on this and the other. None of the coaches actually threw a ball to me in, in my career that I played professional cricket uh, from the 91 to 2000. No, I can agree. I, I mean, when I was a youngster and I came to Newlands with the Super Juice Academy and those kind of things, it wasn't really... I mean, we used to congregate as a group, being like the coloreds and whatever, obviously under 19, and then moving up to the B team and those kind of things. Um, I also wanted to know from you, your commentary um, during club cricket when you were batting is legendary. Where did that all come about? <laughs> well, Ezra, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I, for me, I, I enjoyed playing cricket. And, and, and I found, you know, not a matter of arrogance, but a matter of because of the self-belief that I had, you know, in myself, you know, in terms of what I was doing. And uh, it's just the confidence that I had. And, and I found it just to be, you know, something that just came. And, and, and it became part of who I, who I was back then, you know. Because I enjoyed the competition. And I enjoy, you know, obviously, you know, doing what I'm doing. It was something that I rewarded myself in terms of if, if I play a good shot. And uh, it was something that stuck with me. And obviously, there's a lot of guys who played against me that would remember it more. Because, I mean, I... <laughs> I can't remember all the things that I do once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I wanted to ask you is, um, obviously you moved on from a player then into the coaching. And, you, and, and I mean, if you look at your results, it's been fantastic. I mean, there's no doubting that. Um, I see recently the under-19 post has been advertised. Are you uh, interested? Well, I mean, you know, of course, coaching for me has always been a very passionate, passionate uh, um, um, job for me to do as well. You know, I mean, I'm a physical education teacher, um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I specialized in, in phys ed and uh, sport has always been, you know, very close to me. Um, the post that has been open, I mean, I've got all the qualifications for it. I don't know if I've got the energy for it because I know... You know, at, at my age nowadays, I mean, for me, I'm happy to be part of the supporting group and give all my expertise and all my energy there. Um, um, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, if I'm going to enter my name in that, uh, in that uh, um, uh, under 19 post there. And then yeah. I also wanted to ask you about, um, obviously, playing a lot of cricket uh, in Ireland. Um, 
do you think that it 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 improved with the pros that came over there, uh, like yourself? Well, going overseas was always a dream. You know, I mean, I remember back in ninety, I think nineteen ninety. Um, I was selected in a World Eleven team that was supposed to go and play in, in Canada, Toronto. It never happened because of the situation, the political situation of the country. Um, I saw the other day when I went through the scrapbook in terms of obviously it was selected. I, I can't remember exactly you know, remember the names, but um, that was cancelled. And uh, 1994, I got an opportunity for the first time. <clears throat> in fact, there was an opportunity also to play. Aussie rules rugby. There was a guy that came back also in the 80s, late 80s also, to come and uh, um, uh, look for s players to go and take over to Australia. And I was also earmarked to go and play Aussie rules. That also never uh, materialized because of the rugby. Um, there's a guy called Louis Newman, I think what his name was. Um, he was quite big in, in Aussie rules um, rugby. And then, um, and I always wanted to play county cricket back then, you know, but never an opportunity. I was about the Rujdi Majid that went overseas and so on. And in 1994, I got an opportunity to go to Holland and, and, and coach and play, play, uh, play as a, a, a player coach. And um, I did it there for 14 years to be, to, uh, I loved every moment of it. And, and there I could freely, you know, obviously express myself, take the responsibility on your shoulders in terms of being the pro in the club. Um, and I was fairly successful in being at the, uh, in The Hague and in Dundal. And uh, I also was coach of the national under-15 under teams there also in Holland. So it was a fantastic exposure and an and opportunity for me also to go overseas and, and uh, extend my career in terms of playing and coaching cricket and uh, loved every, every moment of it. Tell me, would you, would you recommend that for any young cricketers coming up? Because obviously, some clubs have a certain expectation of players and if they don't reach that, they, they, they normally bad mouth or sidelined uh, in a specific league or anything like that. Um, that's my first question. And the second question is, you spoke earlier on in, your, in, your, in the interview about um, learning with your eye. I think, uh, do you think that that is one of the things that we're lacking um, in the provincial, semi-provincial, or what do they call it now, provincial level, um, and also in the academy, uh, coming through the younger players? I think there's a place for that. I think there's a place in terms of younger players taking responsibility for their own game. I think we've been been handing over or we've been, ha been giving things too easy to players, you know. I think it is important that when a player goes overseas and, and, and try and obviously improve on his career overseas, it, would be, it will stand him in good stead going forward because the responsibility, you need to take care of your fitness, you need to be aware in terms of cricket. Your cricket awareness will improve because um, everything, you know, um, depends on you as the coach in the, in, in the team there. So if the team is not doing well, they're going to point, you know, the finger at you as the overseas or the uh, professional player that take the responsibility for the team to take them over the line. So I think there is a place for that. Um, but I think also it's important the, the personality that you're taking over. If it's not a guy who can handle that kind of pressure, then I think maybe first develop yourself here and then you can build that kind of pressure. But I think it's definitely something that that will improve any 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 cricketer's uh, career. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ezra. That was awesome questions. Um, I'm gonna go back because we're gonna be running into 45 minutes now. The interview. No, no, no. Last question. <laughs> last question. Last question. Last question. Last question. Okay. <laughs> Who is your absolute favorite roommate on tours? Say that again, because I mean your sound is not so clear. Okay, who is your favorite roommate on tours? Any tour, <laughs> rugby or cricket? <laughs> well, to be honest, my cricket career mostly my roommate was Rachel Gibbs, <laughs> and uh, obviously he's a little bit younger, the talented Rachel Gibbs, and of course we had some amazing. Um, tours together and 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 we had some amazing times together also being room 
mates as well. So uh, the less said, the better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Enjoy the rest of the show, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All, right. all the best. All right. That is a yeah, so you really wanted to come on because when he heard I was interviewing you, he always spoke highly of you as someone that you look, you were someone that you looked up to as a player. So I, I think to get him on to ask you a few questions, I hope you don't mind that. <laughs> so um, that's good. That's good. So you spoke about your teaching over there. Um, my, my mother also spoke about you. I remember when I was younger. Obviously, also wanted to be in cricket. My mother went to Hewitt with you actually back in the day. Um, I don't know if you know um, Yasmin Adams, we asked me know him. Um, so she's always spoken about you and Hewitt. So I wanted to ask you about your Hewitt days and what that was like, um, because a lot of people don't actually know that you were a teacher as well and you studied teaching. Yeah, well, um, Hewitt, you know, back then, you know, I mean, from high school, you always had to obviously you know, choose a career in terms of where you're going to go to. And I think teaching was the safest option then, you know. But um, in my situation, I was blessed that I could have a little bit of a, 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 a school of teaching before I went to Hewitt. So I took like a gap year after matric and uh, went to go and work with my uncle on the building. And uh, oh my God, that was too tough. That was hard. That was three months it was work um, as a tiler. Can you believe it? And, um, and you know, the friends that I played rugby with, I mean, they were te school teachers as well, you know. And uh, I think one of their teachers uh, took ill. And um, he asked me, if I, hey, listen, you've done, you know, mathematics and you've done Afrikaans at matric. So let's, uh, do, do you want to come and teach for three months? Because I think she was off for, for uh, to give birth or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that would be better than being a tyler, you know. So uh, <laughs> I went for three months <clears throat> and I went to a school in Manenberg to go and teach, well, un well unqualified as a, a three-month teacher just to help out. And, uh, you know, to my you know, surprise, it was like something that was almost natural to me. And uh, I enjoyed that three months so much. And I immediately made, you know, plans to go and obviously study further to become a teacher. Mm -hmm. And then the following year, I went to to, to a training college, and it was just opposite uh, uh, City Park. And uh, I went to uh, enroll there, and uh, I then became a, a, a specialized in physical education and mathematics of of all subjects. You wow! Know? So I taught at Alexander Sinton. I started teaching 1987. I started teaching at Alexander Sinton. And um, I resigned from teaching 2000. So I taught for 14 years, high school, um, physical education and mathematics, grade eight and nine. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, so let's get into the questions because we're going to run out of time soon. I'm just going to get one for you here from Tariq Ibrahim. He says you played with a lot of highly talented club cricketers because you also obviously played for Prim Roses and United, etc. So and against them, etc. Who are some of them who you feel had what it took to make it at the professional level, but for some or other reason never made the transition? Well, I mean, I played against a lot of club cricketers because I played until I think it was 45 or something like that, you know. And um, I played for Primroses most of my life. Then I started, I played for Fighted. Uh, then I played for Greenpoint Cricket Club. And then I played for a Nova Park Cricket Club as well. So um, I played as, you know, as player coach at the, most of the clubs. Um, but there were way too many, you know, talented cricketers in, in club cricket. You know, I mean, mm. obviously it was, a, it was a high quality of cricket that was, was played also because you had a lot of kids playing. It was a lot of men that played, you know. So there was a lot of skillful guys around. Um, but it's very difficult to single out one guy you know, that uh, that could have made it because I felt that there was a lot of guys that could have made it to the top. Cool. Um, then we have one here from um, from Ravi Reddy. I'm just looking at the one that we can use. Um, there's quite a few coming in, so I'm not going to ask every single one that we can, <laughs> we can get. But it says, which is the best club in the Western Cape you have ever played against? You'll have to repeat that because why well, your sound is very, very poor. Okay, so which is the best club in the Western Cape you have ever played against? 
Oh, the best club that I played against, you know, there was a couple of tough derbies that we always had, you know. Um, teams like, when I played for Primroses, I mean, teams like Mondros was, was a very difficult team to play against, you know. A team like United was a very difficult team to play against, you know. So that was in, in, in the cricket board time, you know. Um, uh, that is where I, I felt most of the, you know, the, the, the top cricketers were also from, you know, United and, and Montrose. And, and the other clubs also, I mean, if it's Tigers, skillful. I mean, you had a Neville Boyce in there that was also bowling the speed of light back then, you know. Um, but um, most of the clubs, I mean, were very competitive back then. So um, for me, that stands out was always Montrose and United when I played for Primrose back then. Yeah, now obviously you being a coach now, of course, um, transitioning into this, this, this question is perfect for that because it's all about obviously development of cricket. So how important is the club cricket to the franchise system in your opinion? And do you foresee any necessary changes to the club system? I think it is massive. Club cricket is massive. And I think that is where the cricket is supposed to be tough. You know, that is where you, you hone your skills. This is where you... You're playing on, you know, on, on substandard pitches, you know, where you can actually try and give you a batter and it's a substandard pitch. To be able to go and bat long hours, you know, to score hundreds, you know, that will understand your game better. And obviously in terms of bowling, you know, to, to, to land the ball in the right area so that you can pick up more wickets, so, you, so that you can control the game. So I think club cricket, there is a massive... Um, there's massive for improvement in terms of that. There must be also not just one day cricket. I still feel that you have to um, develop your skills and your awareness in the long form of cricket as well. Let's end, let's end up with two fun ones. I'm going to do another one from Tariq over here. He says, how many balls did you hit into Somerset Hospital or even the stands at the track? <laughs> wow, those were back in the days. I mean, I, I was, like I said, I've been going through my, my scrapbook, you know, and I've never read those articles and stuff like that. And it was always a high strike rate, you know. I always batted that way, and I always felt this is what I wanted to do, you know. Mm. Um, really take the game forward, um, being an aggress aggressive type of player. Um, and, uh, yeah, I remember those days at the Green Park, you know, when I was hitting the ball, you know, on the, on the roofs there and, and, and in the hospital there. And it was amazing yeah. times. I mean, really, it was it was times that I really enjoyed. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you one for myself as a follow-up question. Are there any players, because you were an explosive player and someone that would have probably, like us, when I interviewed Lance, he was also someone in the case that he could fit into the, the T20 formats, kind of, which is a format that wasn't really around when you were there. So you are, you are one of those players that would have easily fitted into that, as I've heard. Um, so... Are there any players these days that you've looked at or coached or etc. that you see a little bit of yourself in? Well, um, I don't, it's difficult to say, you know, I mean, the guy that I saw now recently was like Jonathan Bird looked like for me that, that type of player, very aggressive. Um, David Beddingham was also one of them, you know, the, you know, he's now left to play county cricket. Um, Love to have bat on ball type of thing, you know, and and that was me bat on ball. I didn't, I wasn't really fancying to leave balls and stuff like that, you know. Um, yes, there were no T20 back in the day. Um, for me, it was always about you know a high score, high score rate, um, a strike rate in terms of you know when I was batting, um, and a lot of times obviously it was my downfall as well. But uh, enjoyed enjoyed it very much. Okay, lastly, a fun question, because it's going to tie into when you finish with lockdown. And you're not really a takeaways guy, but Golden Dish or Wembley? <laughs> what was that? Golden Dish or Wembley? Wembley, well, Wembley, of course. I mean, you know, I always go there for a, a, a chicken a, a chicken ticker, you know. So, I mean, of course, I mean, those are the kind of things that I go for. Not necessarily the sandwiches. But uh, uh, the the chicken, the whole chicken tikka for me that is that is for me my protein there. Yeah. So with regards to your lockdown now, what are some of the fun things that you're doing besides obviously keeping fit and sending training programs to players? What sort of things are you doing in your downtime for fun now in during this lockdown period? 
up down i've been i've been running up and down my driveway here so i'm doing shuttles in my driveway uh, can you believe it so i'm trying to now you know, keep my cardio going so i'm pulling out my car and then i'm running up and down my driveway say for 20 minutes to try and see if i can just uh, replicate the treadmill stuff so i do some shuttles and uh, then i do some band work i do some bicep curls i do some triceps i do some shoulders and i do four uh, planking so just to keep me going you know so that when you know lockdown is over i don't have to have any muscle aches and muscle pains when i go back to the gym there. and we saw like um actual prince for example trying to create to make cook sisters especially a cook sisters um it is have you been trying anything new or trying anything fun you speak that my, my cooking skills are zero so i mean you know whenever i'm trying you know the food doesn't look or taste what it's supposed to taste like so i rather just go and i get my sister's so kind i mean sometimes you know she's she's providing me with some home cooked food so fantastic otherwise it's hulis pre you know uh, pre packed meal into the microwave two and a half minutes and there's my meal so um yeah well, it's, i wish my amazing cook and i wish i spent what is back then in the kitchen and i will advise any young man to be able to um you know to to inquire that kind of skills to be able to be good in the kitchen because that is uh, it's priceless thanks a lot like this was an amazing conversation i learned a hell of a lot from you um and i'm going to take this and obviously take this video put it on our website share the link with you share the link with our fans just to sign off can you maybe just give a message to the cricket fanatics fans that ask to get you onto this platform well um you know i mean obviously be safe with you know because of the virus you know obviously make sure that you are you know social distancing yourself um take care of yourself I mean look after yourself in terms of the period as well um but you know I mean we know um soon it will be back to a so called normal and uh, you know good time to reflect in terms of where you where you, in terms of your life as well with sport with your personal life with your health with your um your emotional side of things is a good time to reflect and uh, and and try and obviously you know improve as a person when we when we over with this lock with this lockdown thanks a lot Farika and I'll speak to you again very soon thank you for coming on the show I really enjoyed it thanks for having me Ali okay speak to you soon <laughs> all right